Synopsis of the Books of the Bible. John. By J. N. Darby. New Testament. The Gospel of John. Chapter 16. The Holy Spirit looked upon as already here, sufferings and joy predicted. In John 16 a further step is taken in the revelation of this grace. The Holy Ghost is looked upon as already here below. In this chapter the Lord declares that He has set forth all His instruction with regard to His departure, their sufferings in the world as holding His place, their joy, as being in the same relationship to Him as that in which He had been while on earth to His Father, their knowledge of the fact that He was in the Father and they in Him, and He Himself in them, the gift of the Holy Ghost, in order to prepare them for all that would happen when He was gone, that they might not be offended for they should be cast out of the synagogues, and he who should kill them would think that he was serving God. This would be the case with those who, resting in their old doctrines as a form, and rejecting the light, would only use the form of truth by which they accredited the flesh as orthodox to resist the light which, according to the Spirit, would judge the flesh. This would they do because they knew neither the Father nor Jesus, the Son of the Father. It is fresh truth which tests the soul, and faith. Old truth, generally received and by which a body of people are distinguished from those around them, may be a subject of pride to the flesh, even where it is the truth, as was the case with the Jews. But fresh truth is a question of faith in its source, there is not the support of a body accredited by it, but the cross of hostility and isolation. They thought they served God. They knew not the Father and the Son. Nature's sorrow at the Lord's departure, faith's gain. Nature is occupied with that which it loses. Faith looks at the future into which God leads. Precious thought. Nature acted in the disciples, they loved Jesus, they grieved at his going away. We can understand this. But faith would not have stopped there. If they had apprehended the necessary glory of the person of Jesus, if their affection, animated by faith, had thought of him and not of themselves, they would have asked, With a ghost thou. Nevertheless, he who thought of them assures them that it would be gain to them even to lose him. Glorious fruit of the ways of God. Their gain would be in this, that the Comforter should be here on earth with them and in them. Here, observe, Jesus does not speak of the Father. It was the Comforter here below in his stead, to maintain the testimony of his love for the disciples, and his relationship to them. Christ was going away, for if he went not away, the Comforter would not come, but if he departed, he would send him. When he has come, he would act in demonstration of the truth with regard to the world that rejected Christ and persecuted his disciples, and he would act for blessing in the disciples themselves. The Comforter's testimony to the world, its sin in the rejection of Christ. With regard to the world, the Comforter had one only subject of testimony, in order to demonstrate the sin of the world. It has not believed in Jesus, in the Son. Doubtless, there was sin of every kind, and, to speak truth, nothing but sin, sin that deserved judgment, and in the work of conversion, he brings these sins home to the soul. But the rejection of Christ put the whole world under one common judgment. No doubt everyone shall answer for his sins, and the Holy Ghost makes me feel them. But, as a system responsible to God, the world had rejected his Son. This was the ground on which God dealt with the world now, this it was which made manifest the heart of man. It was the demonstration that, God being fully revealed in love such as he was, man would not receive him. He came, not imputing their trespasses unto them, but they rejected him. The presence of Jesus was not the Son of God himself manifested in his glory, from which man might shrink with fear, though he could not escape, it was what he was moral, in his nature, in his character. Men hated him, all testimony to bring man to God was unavailing. The plainer the testimony, the more he turned from it and opposed it. The demonstration of the sin of the world was its having rejected Christ. Terrible testimony, that God in goodness should excite detestation because he was perfect and perfectly good. Such is man. The testimony of the Holy Ghost to the world, as God's to Cain of old, would be, Where is my son? It was not that man was guilty that he was when Christ came, but he was lost, the tree was bad. See note. Note. Man is judged for what he has done, he is lost by what he is, end of note. The demonstration of righteousness, 
Christ at God's right hand. But this was God's path to something altogether different, the demonstration of righteousness, in that Christ, went to his Father, and the world saw him no more. It was the result of Christ's rejection. Human righteousness there was none. Man's sin was proved by the rejection of Christ. The cross was indeed judgment executed upon sin. And in that sense it was righteousness, but in this world, it was the only righteous one condemned by man and forsaken by God. It was not the manifestation of righteousness. It was a final judicial separation between man and God, see John 11 and John 12 verse 31. If Christ had been delivered there and had become the King of Israel, this would not have been an adequate consequence of his having glorified God. Having glorified God his Father, he was going to sit at his right hand, at the right hand of the Majesty on high, to be glorified in God himself, to sit on the Father's throne. To set him there was divine righteousness, see John 13 verses 31 and 32, and John 17 verses 1 to 5. This same righteousness deprived the world, as it is, of Jesus forever. Man saw him no more. Righteousness in favor of men was in Christ at God's right hand, in judgment as to the world, in that it had lost him hopelessly and forever. Satan, the prince of this world, judged. Moreover, Satan had been proved to be the prince of this world by leading all men against the Lord Jesus. To accomplish the purposes of God in grace, Jesus does not resist. He gives himself up to death. He who has the power of death committed himself thoroughly. In his desire to ruin man he had to hazard everything in his enterprise against the prince of life. He was able to associate the whole world with himself in this, Jew and Gentile, priest and people, governor, soldier, and subject. The world was there, headed by its prince, on that solemn day. The enemy had everything at stake, and the world was with him. But Christ has risen, he has ascended to his Father, and has sent down the Holy Ghost. All the motives that govern the world, and the power by which Satan held men captive, are shown to be of him. He is judged. The power of the Holy Ghost is the testimony of this and surmounts all the powers of the enemy. The world is not yet judged, that is, the judgment executed, it will be in another manner, but it is morally, its prince is judged. All its motives, religious and irreligious, have led it to reject Christ, placing it under Satan's power. It is in that character that he has been judged, for he led the world against him who is manifested to be the Son of God by the presence of the Holy Ghost consequent on his breaking the power of Satan and death. The Holy Spirit's presence here the proof of the world's rejection of the Son of God. All this took place through the presence on earth of the Holy Ghost, sent down by Christ. His presence in itself was the demonstration of these three things. For, if the Holy Ghost was here, it was because the world had rejected the Son of God. Righteousness was evidenced by Jesus being at the right hand of God, of which the presence of the Holy Ghost was the proof, as well as in the fact that the world had lost him. Now the world which rejected him was not outwardly judged, but, Satan having led it to reject the Son, the presence of the Holy Ghost proved that Jesus had destroyed the power of death, that he who had possessed that power was thus judged that he had shown himself to be the enemy of him whom the father owned, that his power was gone, and victory belonged to the second Adam, when Satan's whole power had been arrayed against the human weakness of him who in love had yielded to it. But Satan, thus judged, was the prince of this world. The Holy Spirit's work in and for the disciples. The presence of the Holy Ghost should be the demonstration not of Christ's rights as Messiah, true as they were, but of those truths that related to man to the world, in which Israel was now lost, having rejected the promises, although God would preserve the nation for himself. But the Holy Ghost was doing something more than demonstrating the condition of the world. He would accomplish a work in the disciples, he would lead them into all truth, and he would show them things to come, for Jesus had many things to tell them which they were not yet able to bear. When the Holy Ghost should be in them, he should be their strength in them as well as their teacher, and it would be a wholly different state of things for the disciples. Here he is considered as present on the earth in place of Jesus, and dwelling in the disciples, not as an individual spirit speaking from himself, but even as Jesus said, as I hear I judge, with a judgment perfectly divine and heavenly, so the Holy Ghost, 
acting in the disciples, would speak that which came from above, and of the future, according to divine knowledge. It should be heaven and the future of which he would speak, communicating what was heavenly from above, and revealing events to come upon the earth, the one and the other being witnesses that it was a knowledge which belonged to God. How blessed to have that which he has to give. The Holy Spirit taking the place of Christ here. But, further, he takes here the place of Christ. Jesus had glorified the Father on earth. The Holy Ghost would glorify Jesus, with reference to the glory that belonged to his person and to his position. He does not here speak directly of the glory of the Father, the disciples had seen the glory of the life of Christ on earth, the Holy Ghost would unfold to them his glory in that which belonged to him as glorified with the Father, that which was his own. They would learn in part. This is man's measure when the things of God are in question, but its extent is declared by the Lord himself, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore, said I, he shall take of mine, and shall show it to you. Christ's name and glory. Thus we have the gift of the Holy Ghost variously presented in connection with Christ. Independence on his Father, and representing his disciples as gone up from among them, on their behalf, he addresses himself to the Father, he asks the Father to send the Holy Ghost, John 14 verse 16. Afterwards, we find that his own name is all-powerful. All blessing from the Father comes in his name. It is on his account, and according to the efficacy of his name, of all that in him is acceptable to the Father, that good comes to us. Thus the Father will send the Holy Ghost in his name, John 14 verse 26. And Christ being glorified on high, and having taken his place with his Father, he himself sends the Holy Ghost, John 15 verse 26, from the Father, as proceeding from him. Finally, the Holy Ghost is present here in this world, in and with the disciples, and he glorifies Jesus, and takes of his and reveals it to his own, John 16 verses 13 to 15. Here all the glory of the person of Christ is set forth, as well as the rights belonging to the position he has taken. All things that the Father has are his. He has taken his position according to the eternal counsels of God, in virtue of his work as Son of Man. But if he has entered into possession in this character, all that he possesses in it is his, as a son to whom, being one with the Father, all that the Father has belonged. The Lord's coming departure to his Father the disciples encouraged to draw nigh to the Father. There he should be hidden for a while, the disciples should afterwards see him, for it was only the accomplishment of the ways of God, it was no question of being, as it were, lost by death. He was going to his Father. On this point the disciples understood nothing. The Lord develops the fact and its consequences, without yet showing them the whole import of what he said. He takes it up on the human and historical side the world would rejoice at having got rid of him. Miserable joy. The disciples would lament, although it was the true source of joy for them, but their sorrow should be turned into joy. As testimony, this took place when he showed himself to them after his resurrection, it will be fully accomplished when he shall return to receive them unto himself. But when they had seen him again, they should understand the relationship in which he has placed them with his father, they should enjoy it by the Holy Ghost. It should not be as though they could not themselves draw nigh to the Father, while Christ could do so. As Martha said, I know that whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, he will give it thee. They might themselves go directly to the Father, who loved them, because they had believed in Jesus, and had received him when he had humbled himself in this world of sin, in principle it is always thus, and asking what they would in his name they should receive it, so that their joy might be full in the consciousness of the blessed position of unfailing favor into which they were brought, and of the value of all that they possessed in Christ. The disciples' limited apprehension of the Lord's meaning. Nevertheless, the Lord already declares to them the basis of the truth, he came from the Father, he was going away to the Father. The disciples think they understand that which he had thus spoken without a parable. They felt that he had divined their thought, for they had not expressed it to him. Yet they did not rise really to the height of what he said. He had told them that they had believed in his having come from God. This they understood, and that which had taken place had confirmed them in this faith, and they declare their conviction with regard to this truth, but they do not enter into the thought of coming from the Father, and going away to the Father. 
they fancied themselves quite in the light, but they had apprehended nothing that raised them above the effect of Christ's rejection, which the belief that he came from the Father and was going to the Father would have done. Jesus, therefore, declares to them, that his death would scatter them, and that they would forsake him. His Father would be with him, he should not be alone. Nevertheless, he had explained all these things to them, in order that they should have peace in him. In the world that rejected him, they should have tribulation, but he had overcome the world, they might be of good cheer, 